This chapter is going to introduce a specific kind of system called an ERP, or Enterprise Resource Planning. This is basically a very large system that is usually kind of the linchpin or cornerstone of any enterprise business. So we're going to talk about kind of what is an ERP, what are we doing with it, and then we're also going to take a look at that in the terms of the general ledger as well. As we look at accounting systems, probably the one you're going to be most familiar with is just the stuff that you've used in intro to accounting classes of the journal and ledgers and all that sort of thing. So we're going to work with that as our sort of core example and then illustrate how ERP connects to it in this chapter. So the key outcomes are you should know about the term ERP, what it means, and you should also be kind of brushed up a bit on the whole cycle for this. How are transactions actually input, stored, processed, and output? And if you're paying attention, you'll notice that we talk about input, storage, processing, output pretty repeatedly. This is a common sort of set of, of activities that we want to think through with all the different cycles that we automate. So here's the four key pieces. How does data get into the system? What do we do to it once it's in there? How do we store it and in what format? And then what kind of information needs to be output? So if you think about a basic example of this, think about going to the store and buying a jug of milk. You walk into the Kroger, you grab something, you walk over to the register. When you do the register, the clerk is going to scan the barcode on the milk, that's data input. It's going to process by saying, all right, how much do we need to charge for sales tax and calculate that for you. On the back end, it's also probably going to do some work with tracking inventory as well to show that we're down one unit of milk. In terms of storage, we want to store some information. That could be the date that the milk was sold. It could be the time. It could have information about your loyalty card so we know that Bob purchased this piece, this, this unit of milk. And then we have to output that information. Information could be output on a daily sales record. It could be output for storage, um, for inventory management purposes, lots of different kinds of things. But that's sort of the, the four key pieces we want to think through of any of these cycles. So let's think through the accounting cycle. So this is trying to kind of refresh your memory on a familiar task. And then in class, we're going to actually go ahead and build some of this out. So step one, analyze source documents. This is the accountant sitting at their desk looking at something that has happened. And the source document could be a receipt, it could be an email, it could even be a database record in your system. But there's some kind of piece of data that you're going to want to get into your accounting system. Next thing, you're going to take that and put it into the journal with a transaction. So if you think back to your intro to accounting classes, the, the journal is sort of like the log. It's a daily record of everything that happened to you. And so it's organized as daily records. Each transaction gets input and recorded. So for a transaction, you might have, again, for our example of milk, uh, the store is down one unit of milk. So we're going to take that asset and reduce it, which would be a credit. Uh, they are up cash. So we're going to debit cash to show that we have money that we did not have before. So those are just sort of ideas. Like we're going to take this transaction and throw it into a journal. Next, we post that to the general ledger. Now, the journal is great because it shows us sort of a daily log of everything that happened. However, we really want to know what's the total of each account that we're interested in. So for the milk, how many total milk items do we have? How many total dollars do we have? And so you'll next take that transaction and put it into the general ledger to show the status of every single account. Now, a lot of this is really not two steps in systems, um, but we can kind of think of it that way, sort of as a logical process coming through here. Okay, next, end period adjusted entry. So now we're going to make a little bit of a break here. So these things all are going to happen repeatedly. We're going to analyze the document, we're going to transact, we're going to post it. It kind of goes over and over again. The end of period adjusted entry says, now we're done. We need to do a couple of quick tweaks. So what are some things that have happened in the real world that are not yet reflected with a source document in our system? So for example, we might have had one unit of milk go bad. So we have a clerk go through, he or she pulls a couple of jugs of milk off, 
and then shoots an email to the accountant saying, hey, we have some spoilage, so we have to mark that sort of thing off. This would also be where areas like depreciation and you know, all the kind of stuff, that basically things that have happened in the world that we need our system to match. Next step is we have our trial balance. Now, trial balance is very straightforward. We're basically going to show just a list of everything that we have and what the balances are. And again, this is going to be automated to some extent, but you still need to think through kind of the different pieces. This is make sure that credits equals debits. All right, and then we can see everything working okay. And then lastly, we're going to go ahead and prepare a financial statement. This is things like the income statement, the balance sheet, all that kind of stuff. And then closing entries is going to reset our accounting system so that it's ready to go for the next month. Now, if we did the full accounting cycle, there's some extra steps in here, but I'm kind of simplifying it down to just the key elements that we're going to play with as we build out our first little accounting system in class. Okay, so now that we know the overall process, let's talk about some of the things that we're going to have to do with it. So first off, we might think about data input, right? How do we capture that information? Now, information is going to be given to us in different sorts of formats. It could be an email, it could be a database record. But we want to make sure that we capture data accurately and completely. And we want to make sure that we are following policies. So this is part of the controls aspect. If you have someone go out there and buy something, how do you make sure they did it right? Or for example, we think about the milk spoilage question. How do we know that the clerk isn't just taking a jug of milk home every day and saying that it was spoiled? How do we actually know that it was spoiled? So we need to make sure that we have some controls in place to make sure that data is input correctly and completely. We think about what kind of data do we want to actually collect? We think like what kind of activity is it? Who does it involve? And who are the people that were engaged in that? And so if, again, we think back to the spoilage of milk, you probably want to record that Tim was the person that recorded this information. It was a 2% milk, and we're recording a daily spoilage information. We look at source documents. There's different kinds of documents you might get. We have some that are just standard paper. It might be an invoice. We also have what's called a turnaround document. Now, if you've ever gotten a bill from a company at your house or apartment, and it had a bunch of pre-printed information and asked you to put, put a check and then send it back. That's a turnaround document. The idea here is that there's less chance of getting information keyed in incorrectly if you give the person a pre-filled form that all they need to do is sign or check. Nowadays, we have a lot of point of sale information as well. So these are things we don't have clerks typing a bunch of data in manually, but instead we can just cap capture data in electronic format as quickly as possible. So in class, we're going to talk about some examples. And so we're going to use the example of a coffee mug company. So we're going to have a question about what kind of processes do we need to make this work? So do a quick summary of the business. So the coffee mug company is going to make sales via a third-party e-commerce website. So they're interested in selling coffee cups. They're not going to build their own website. They're going to go to some online vendor that sells it for us. We're also going to ship directly from the distributor to the customer, so we don't have to worry about holding inventory or shipping. That makes things fairly simple. We want to make sure that we get the money quickly, so we're going to allow credit cards. For, and we're going to limit customers to only 10 orders per month. And the idea here is that we don't want to have someone come in, make thousands of dollars of orders, and then never actually pay us with a credit card. We can have issues with credit cards because uh, people can steal credit cards, use them to make purchases, and then report, and then we never get the money because the credit card company is not going to give us money if it was an invalid transaction. Another key element we need to do here is a manual review of all chargebacks. So this is saying that the manager needs to take a look at all of the sales that have happened over the month, see which of them are hit by chargebacks. In other words, the credit card company doesn't give us the money, and then try and figure out if there's ways for us to better make sure that we don't have invalid or fraudulent sales. So in class, I want you to think about what process are you going to use for entering sales data? So think about that third-party e-commerce website. How do you think you're going to get the data from them into your company? Think about what are the different source documents you might have in this scenario? Who's going to send you either paper, email? Are there going to be websites you go to to pull information? And then how are you going to have accurate controls to verify that this is happening accurately and is following all of the policies? How do you make sure this happens? So think through this example, and we'll talk about it in class. 
All right, so now we've talked about data input, let's go into data storage. How then do we take this data and put it into our organization? Well, the first thing we're gonna to need to do is have some kind of chart of accounts. So this is things like you know, assets, you know, inventory, uh, you might have an asset account for equipment, um, all different kinds of things. So basically, like what accounts do you need? These accounts are usually gonna have some kind of coding scheme. So like all asset accounts start with zero one, all expense accounts start with five one. You know, there's different things you could do to kind of make it easier to keep track of the different accounts. We also have transaction journals. And this is the idea that we're going to need a way to kind of filter down information by customer. And we'll give you an example in a second here. We also have subsidiary ledger. So these are things, again, are ways to kind of trace and filter down information to make it a little bit easier to work with. So let's look at an example. Let's look at how we record and post a credit sale for this company here. So what we have is a sales journal. Now a sales journal is a tool that allows you to more quickly input information. Now you could go into the general journal, that'd be fine. But the general journal you have to identify every time which accounts are being used and it's kind of a little bit tedious. If you're making the same account debits and credits every single time, it's a lot faster to use a sales journal, so it's more streamlined. You can kind of see an example of how this all flows through. So we start with the sales journal. You see we have our individual account that we need to connect with for our customer, and we have an amount on the side. The final amount here, our 15,000 amount, we're gonna then post to the general ledger. So you can see following the lines here that the amount balances between the 15,000 and the 15,000 on this side. And so what we have here are basically every day a clerk is going to record a whole bunch of individual sales. At the end of the day, it posts to say, take the final number and stick that into our general ledger. And one of the goals of here is that the general ledger doesn't get quite so cluttered. Uh, it's easier to trace things if we don't have thousands and thousands of, of entries. Instead, we can say, oh yeah, sales for the 15th of October were 15,000. Sales for the 14th of October were 12,000. So this is the general ledger in the AR account. We also notice that we're going to post to another account credit sales. So this is the debit matching the credit. So we say for our credit sales, again, we have October 15th, sales, and 15,000. And you can kind of get an idea of like, this is faster, right? We have 15,000 and it shows up one time in the general ledger on the AR side and one time in the credit sales. Instead of having to input the, the, every single one of these numbers in every single account. All right, so now beyond the general ledger items, we also need to keep track of the individual customer account with, that we need to record as well. So for example, Brown Hospital Supply needs $798. And if we follow that line, you can see down here in the AR receivable subsidiary ledger. So AR means accounts receivable, means people owe us money, we're gonna get money in, receive. Subsidiary ledger basically just means that it goes underneath the general ledger. So the general ledger AR, we have our entry and our amount is in there. But the subsidiary basically says, okay, of that 15,000, how much of it goes to each customer? So think of this like a breakout of what we have above here. This is the detailed records. And on top we have the general records. So now for our particular customer, we can say, all right, we have a transaction for 18,000, sorry, uh, $1,876 and that's gonna pop up here on the debit side. And one of the goals we have behind this subsidiary ledger is that you would share this with the customer in some kind of monthly invoice to say, hey, here are the transactions you made with us, here's how much money you need to pay us for whatever you've bought from us this week. So this is sort of an idea of walking through a sale. And when you hear the words, you know, journal versus ledger versus subsidiary, you know, it can get kind of confusing. But think of it like this, journal is your daily log, right? Those are Every day you input the new item in there. Ledger is a record for each account. So we have our ledger for AR, our ledger for credit sales. And that just simply is a different way of viewing the journal information, but it's a lot quicker to scan through and say, hey, what's hit my AR account in the last week? Subsidiary is just a detailed view of the general ledger. So we've already put that 15 grand of the daily sales into AR, but I need to know how much of that 15 grand belongs to each customer. 
And so that goes into the subsidiary ledger so we can track how much does KDR actually owe for this month. Now all of this is sort of modeled on a paper system where you could print things out and copy and paste and uh, or literally copy and write out by hand. Now in a modern system, we're not gonna have that sort of approach. I mean, really, I want to input things one time. And then as I input things into Brown Hospital Supply, I want the system to automatically put that into the AR ledger for Brown Hospital Supply. I'm not going to retype all the data in. Same thing at the end of the day, I'm just going to click a button saying, you know, put one daily entry into the general ledger for AR and credit sales. So this is kind of like showing you all the steps. It is simpler and more efficient in a computer, though. All right, so that's the chart of accounts, transaction journals, and the ledger element. And the idea is that we can trace the path of a transaction, see how it flows through a system. Now, when we do all these accounts, we have a lot of different accounts to keep track of. And so how do we record them and keep them all straight from each other? So we have codes. There are a lot of ways we can do this. One example is a sequence code. A sequence code is just one, two, three, four, five. So think about a checkbook. You would start with check one, go to check two, check three, check four, check five. And the sequence code is easy, it's straightforward. It helps you notice if you've accidentally mislaid a check or anything like that. It's, it's pretty, pretty solid. It doesn't work for everything, though. We also have things that are called block codes. So a block code is something where we're not going to number like one, two, three, four, five. Instead, we're going to make, say, for example, a code for each product. So for Starbucks, we might have a code for all coffees start with 01. And then a black coffee is 0101. A coffee with milk is 0102. A coffee that's an espresso is 0103. And then we say, all right, well, that's all of our coffees. We're going to start with 01. And we want for all of our coffee mugs to start with 02. So our first unit of just a black Starbucks mug is 0201. Right, so it's basically a way to kind of keep track of the different elements. And then we can look at a product number and say, hey, it starts with 02. I know that's going to be a coffee mug. We can also have other groups where we have two or more subgroups of digits, for example, a car VIN number, and also mnemonic codes. Um, for example, you might think about Sears here. Uh, we, they have a code dry 300 w 5 So it says 300 identifies that's a low-end driver. W is white, uh, it's made by Sears 05. And so again, just sort of more complicated versions of it. You can kind of think of these all kind of flow in ultimately into kind of the same thing. But think of sequence is one, two, three, four, five. Block coding means we do something a little more complex. All right, so now we have that information. What are we gonna do with it? We have two places to put information. We can call these master files and transaction files. This is something you're going to get hit with a lot in the auditing class because we treat these files differently. So for example, we have a bunch of sales. So we have here our customers XYZ and ABC, and we have information on that customer, like their number, their address, their credit limit, and their balance. Now that will be stored in a master file. It's in a master file because it's sort of key information about our customers. Because it's about the customers, it's going to be stored in that file. And we're going to control access to this file kind of carefully. I don't want someone to come in here and change their credit limit. I don't want to have a clerk come in and change an address. If I let anyone who wants to come in to my AIS system and change QRS address, then they can commit fraud pretty easily. Imagine if they want to send out a refund to QRS. They go into the system, they change the address, they mail off and print their, their refund, and then change the address back. And now it goes to their house and not QRS. So master data is the idea that it stores about individual entities or organizations. Transactions are a little different. Transactions are events, things that have happened. So for QRS, an event could be they have made a particular sale. And usually transactions are connected to specific time and date events. So they're, they're temporary, they're tied to an income statement, like a revenue or an expense transaction. Master files are things that are gonna be ongoing. They're gonna survive past a single period. Say for example, again, information about companies. So let's think about, again, our coffee mug scenario. So with our coffee mug sales, let's think through what kind of storage are you gonna to wanna to use for these 
records in the accounting system. What accounts do you have? What are your master and your transaction files? And how might you code some of these items? Now, when we look at data, we think about how we're going to process this information once we've captured it and once we've stored it. We can break this down to four different kinds of processing. And we use this fun little acronym called CRUD. CRUD splits us into four different sets of permissions. Create, read, update, and delete. So create would be I add a new customer to my database. Reading just says I get a look at something that's already in there. Updating means I get to change something, and delete means I remove it from my system. Now you're going to think about different permissions for each of these because not everyone should have full permission. So imagine you hire someone to come in and work on updating your information for you. So for ABC coffee mugs, do you want to let the clerk create new records? Well, if they're inputting data, then definitely. But you might give them permission for the transaction data, but not the master data. So they can input sales, but they can't input new vendors or new customers. You might think about reading. It could be that we don't give them permission to read old data. They only get data that they particularly have inputted. Some people will need update permissions. So once something's been input, they can change it. And very few people should have delete data permission. When we think about working with actual real systems, often they don't truly delete anything. Instead, what will happen is they'll have a field on the row saying, is, have I been deleted? And if it says yes, then it's going to hide it from all of the users. And this is part of our creation of an audit trail. We want to make sure we know what happens in the system. So thinking about our particular coffee company again, you may want to think about how we're going to update our inventory. If we update at the end of each day, that will be a batch process. If we update on every sale, that will be a real-time process. So now I want you to think through what are the staff permissions for create, read, update, and delete for our company? Who should get access to what? Now let's talk about output. How do we get data out of the system and used by our end users? So obviously they can look at the system. That's pretty straightforward. They have a website or some kind of application that gets installed on the computer. But usually we also need some kind of printout or hard copies of this. It could be an invoice that we send to our customers. It could be a report that goes to the CEO. Or it could be a specific query information, like who, who has an outstanding AR account, or what records or what mugs need to be shipped to what customer. So think about, for your system, what are the different documents, reports, and queries you're going to be able to need to pull out of your AIS? So the idea here behind an ERP is that we're really trying to integrate activities from the whole organization. So, so far, we've really focused on the general ledger and reporting system elements because you should be somewhat familiar with the general ledger from your prior accounting courses. But also, we're going to want to tie in other elements as well for revenue. We might have an online form where customers can input their sales directly into our ERP so we don't have to rekey anything. For our expenditures, we might have the system automatically send invoices when we need to um, take care of any sort of payments back and forth. For production, we might have our ERP system manual inventory and do automatic resupply. And for HR, we can, might handle time card information. So an ERP system is going to really look at all of these things together. Now the sad truth is that ERPs are not perfect. And so you usually have other systems hanging around as well, but the ERP should be sort of the cornerstone of data for your organization, sort of the single source of truth about a fact or event. Now, there are a lot of good things about ERPs. It gives us a single view of the organization's data. Before we have ERPs, you end up with a bunch of Excel files on one person's desk, a website on another person's task list, and some kind of printout on someone else's desk. And you have to go to all of these to find information. So that's not an efficient way of dealing with things. So these are trying to integrate a single view of our data. We want to capture data only once. We don't want our salespeople to be recording data every single time they talk to someone. We want to store it one time. We want to be able to monitor it. How are we doing? What are the day's sales? What's our profit for today? We want to control the data better through security settings. A lot of the more informal systems, think about things like uh, Excel files, are very difficult to control and make sure that they're actually being only given to those who need access to it. 
We're going to standardize procedures to try and make things more consistent among different users. Hopefully, this is going to improve our customer service. Our customers don't need to go to five different apartments to update the information. They can go to one place. And then hopefully, we can also automate as much as possible. Now, there are some significant disadvantages. The first one is that these are incredibly costly systems. Even for a small organization, we're talking about millions and millions of dollars in time and in direct costs. They also take us a lot of time to implement. ERPs are so tightly woven into your processes for the normal business that ripping them out and re to putting it in a system kind of requires redesigning the entire process. You can think about different systems used at WVU. Uh, think about having to change STAR or eCampus. Think about how many times different people are going to have to go into those and how many people on campus those systems touch. This also involves a lot of business process redesign. Uh, often, systems are designed to work a certain way. And if your business does it a little bit differently, you have to change the way your business works in order to make the system work for you. These tend to be very complex because they handle so many different kinds of system processes. And we often find a lot of user resistance. And this is just natural because people find learning new things challenging and they don't appreciate having their jobs redesigned underneath them. Hopefully this was a good overview of transaction processing and enterprise resource planning systems. We're trying to follow through a basic ledger and journal system and hopefully you'll be able to think through kind of what the elements are of those systems and how we can do that in an AIS. It also gave you a real brief overview of ERPs so just so you have a basic idea of what these systems are and what are the major advantages and disadvantages of them.